Thank you so much for everybody being here, and especially our speaker who's coming all the way from uh, Querétaro, uh, which is really a treat because, uh, believe it or not, Luis and I have never met in person until today. Uh, but we have been in communication uh, about the kinds of things that uh, this particular talk represents. And it's just a, a, real, uh, a plug for the Spanish talks. So the culture of science on this campus, uh, mainly due to the Hispanic uh, serving initiatives, uh, Dean uh, Carmen asked uh, all the department heads, all the units, to please uh, have a, some form of talk or some form of activity that is aligned the mission of the university when it comes to Hispanic serving initiatives. So when I heard that, I was thinking, oh, well, that's interesting. And I wonder if we can do something. And so uh, Astro Charlas was the first set of Spanish speaking talks on this campus. Uh, the other department that did it was speech, hearing, and language and sciences. So uh, Dr. Miller, who's here, knows that. I was part of that. Uh, and uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, Dr. Luis Carrillo Reed will be speaking here in Spanish. Very excited that the Mexican consulate in Tucson shared it widely. Uh, it's on Zoom. This is, this is on Zoom. It's being recorded. I believe there's already people on Zoom as well. And I actually uh, was a little, uh, I pressured Luis to, to do two talks rather than one. So he's doing today in English and then tomorrow in Spanish. Uh, and I, I just, I don't have a lot of comments to introduce Luis because I don't want to eat his time. But I do want to say just a very few number of things. First of all, he lives in uh, Curiquilla, which the Instituto of Neurobiología is uh, just right well outside Quereta, Mexico. Uh, but Luis uh, has discovered many things that we have in affinity, not Jiu Jitsu, but many other things. But Luis uh, received his Bachelor of Science in Electronics and Biomedical Sciences from UNAM. Later, he received his PhD in Biomedical Sciences, I imagine, at the Instituto of Fisiología Celular, uh, Aruna, as well. And after that, uh, he did uh, a series of, I would say, postdocs in three different locations. First one in Okinawa, in Japan, Japan where he focused on computational neuroscience. Then he came back to the continent America, and he went to Northwestern University. Did you work with Sir Smyer? Yeah, Sir Smyer. Yeah. yeah. So he worked with uh, James Sirmeyer, uh, looking at neurodegenerative diseases, dopaminergic aspects of disease in the brain. And then uh, right before he returned to beautiful Curiquilla, uh, he actually went to uh, Rafa Eustace's lab uh, at Columbia University in New York where he really sort of perfected the two photon uh, optogenetics in vivo, actually, which is uh, uh, something that we're very excited to hear about. Uh, I'm not gonna disclose more, but uh, if you see uh, Luis Carrillo Reed's uh, bow sketch, it's, it's really, uh, to me, it's an inspiration. Uh, you really are, uh, and not just to me, but to many students. So thank you for being here. I love that you use Neuro Charnas. I love that. Thank you and welcome to Tucson. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Liz, for the and the organizers for bringing me here. Uh, I think, especially at this time of the year, that we are all in finals and reviews and stuff, it's kind of hard to do paperwork. But thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, if you want to interrupt me at any time, please feel free just to talk and ask me. Uh, I, I will go in some parts with more detail, but if you need like more explanation, just, just tell me and, and ask Grace. Um, and today uh, I will talk about this uh, optical control of neuronal ensembles to understand perception, behavior, and disease. And uh, so in this talk, I will talk mainly about optical methods and what we can do pretty well with optical methods. And I will try to convince you that with optical methods, we can do these five things. One of them is to identify neuronal ensembles. The second one is to create ensembles also in the brain. The third one is to recall ensembles that are related to a given behavior. 
Then uh, we can also study neural ensembles in pathological conditions. And finally, I will talk about some of the experiments I'm doing now in my lab. Uh, that is like uh, neuromodulation of ensembles also using light. So, but what's a neural ensemble? So, uh, in neuroscience, for some reason, every time that neuroscientists find something, they want to name it differently. <laughs> so, <laughs> this concept of neural ensembles that is mainly a group of neurons doing a specific physiological function have received many names from central pattern generators, cell assemblies, simpar chains attractors or neuronal ensembles. And depending on the part of the brain that uh, people were studying, they, they use like different names, like almost randomly, you know? But all these people and all these concepts are defining a specific group of neurons that fire together in a given time window and that they are related to a given experimental condition or a behavior. So that, that will be the definition of neuronal ensemble that, that I will be talking about uh, in this class. So you, you can see many names here that people that actually pursue this idea and, and try to demonstrate that the groups of neurons are the important thing to understand how the brain works. Uh, so when I started to do this kind of optical approaches to try to figure out how the activity of different groups of neurons uh, uh, means something different for, for, for the brain. I always had this dream experiment that was to be able to manipulate a specific behavior. So what, would, what, what do we need to actually make through this, this dream experiment? First, we need a behavior, you know, you, you need a specific behavior that you can control and that you know that is represented in a specific part of the brain. So you can go and image that part of the brain. Then uh, we need to identify the groups of neurons that are related to that specific behavior that we have very, uh, in very controlled conditions. And as a first step, we also need to figure out the functional connectivity of those neurons and understand how the manipulation of the activity of those neurons will be related to the behavior. So these are kind of the, the three main concepts that we need to control a behavior using optical methods. And one approach that there are now many approaches to do this, but one approach of that is, is to use a microscope to simultaneously record and activate neurons with high precision. So this microscope that I will be talking about in the experiments today, we use two different lasers. We have two path, uh, two, two optical paths. One is the imaging laser that we will use to see the activity of the neurons. That, that will be in a, a wavelength of 94 nanometers. And we can see GCAM with this uh, laser. To see the activity of the neurons, we inject a virus in the brain that will express the genetically encode calcium indicator in the neuron. So every time that the neurons have activity, they will shine like the stars. And on the other hand, we have a second laser that will go through a different optical path. And uh, it's, a, it's, co it's coupled to, uh, yeah, with a special light modulator. A special light modulator is pretty much a liquid crystal device, like the ones you have in projectors that you can control with a computer and generate a hologram. Pretty much you can create any pattern of activity with this uh, uh, special light modulator. So those two different lasers, they have different wavelengths. The experiments I will talk about today, the stimulation laser, the phylogenetics laser, it, it, it has a 10, 64 nanometer uh, wavelength. And that's used to activate an opsin that is called C1B1. This opsin C1B1 was designed for red shifted wavelengths. Yeah. You probably you know optogenetics. The optogenetics is like this technique that you can control the activity of neurons with light. You express opsins in the neurons, and then when you shine the light, you activate those neurons. 
most of the normal uh, opsins that are used for optogenetics, they use blue light, no? So if we use that blue light with this one, that will interfere with the imaging. That's why we need two different wavelengths. So the uh, lasers and, and the, the artifact of the light doesn't overlap. So we can distinguish the imaging and we can separate that from the stimulation, you see? So all the experiments I will talk about today are in primary visual, most of them are in primary visual cortex. We have mice. Uh, I didn't do a craniotomy in the mice. I just do this technique that is called thin skull. We thin the skull, very, very thin, like 10 microns. And we can see and stimulate through the skull and we can actually see what's happening. Why I did this? Because when you open the skull, sometimes uh, you can have some undesired like uh, artifacts, you know. But 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 so so this is how it looks like on, on your right side. You can see like the vasculature. So we can actually see through the the brain just like by eye when when you do this this kind of technique uh, with with care. No, the the mice that I use they are running. They are free moving. They have the head fixed because we need to put a microscope on on their heads. But they can move like uh, really, and uh, we will have a monitor in front of the eye so we can project some images and record in the primary visual cortex that is uh, behind the, the, the head. So um, I don't know if you can actually see, is there a way to turn off the light and people don't get asleep? Yeah. Yeah. So you said that you tuned the um, wavelengths to um, not interfere with each other, but isn't 940 for the two photon pretty close to that red shifted um, 1064. What one would be like in the green bluish spectrum, and there is totally in the red spectrum. Is, yeah, yeah, they, they, they don't overlap at all. Okay. If you want to do this kind of things with one P, for example, one photon, you can use a red shifted, uh, a red uh, uh, GCAM, like RCAM, uh, a red genetically encoded calcium indicator. And the blue option to, to stimulate. Yeah, yeah. But with 2P, this you, you, you don't get like uh, huge artifacts when you turn on the light. So you can actually follow the activity when you are stimulated. I will show a video later. Yeah. Okay. Ah, How do you thin the skull? We, we use a drill, like uh, the drill that like dentists use, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, you just need to be very careful and practice like 100 times. And then you 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 can really thin it. Uh, when you get it like correctly, uh, and you have the like ten to fourteen microns, the, the skull becomes like uh, uh, some kind of uh, flexible uh, thing. So you you see it's it's actually waving, you know, and it it almost becomes like transparent when you put some liquid in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there a specific um, reason or importance as to why you were allowed the mice to move instead of fixing the whole body? Yeah, we, we wanted to, I mean, I wanted eventually to put the mouse in kind of a virtual reality thing. So, so the, the images are actually related with the movement. I didn't do in this, in this experiment, but I, I wanted to do that. I also wanted to see if in primary visual cortex, there are signals related to movement. Because, you know, uh, sometimes for primary cortices, the consensus is that they, they just encode like the modality of, uh, of the external stimuli that, that they are supposed to do. So, so I wanted to see if, if there are more signals in there. And, and actually, they, they are, yeah, at least in my. Yeah. Okay. So, this is how. Uh, a recording of layer two, three of primary visual cortex looks like. In this one, I was showing to the to the mice two different orientations, like, like vertical bars and horizontal bars, and you can see clearly where the neurons are. The, the white things are the neurons. You can especially actually see exactly where they are, uh, and every time they are shining, that means that they have bursts of action potentials, then when they stop firing, they get dim. And then you can, you can see this uh, 
pretty like reliably every time that you put images to the mouse you can see some things happening if you if i let let you hear like four hours just looking at this video you will start to see different patterns of activity you know uh, right now probably is, is, if this, this is the first time you see this you 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 cannot believe me that there are groups of neurons firing at different times but believe me after four thousand hours or watching this thing you just start to kind of not not hallucinating it just you start to feel, <laughs> your brain kind of start to understand that there are some things there so uh, but that that's one of the main things now that we have all this uh, information what can we do with all this information you know we, we don't have just one neuron now we have hundreds of neurons at the same time so how can we actually analyze this thing one way to simplify this uh, activity of so many neurons is to make a representation of that video that I just showed you into a binary array. That's kind of one way to do it. And how, how can we do this? This on the left, on the top left, is at the tra calcium transients of one neuron, and the bars are the visual stimuli. So especially this neuron, every time I was showing a specific visual stimuli, the neuron responded. That's why it goes up. In the video, when the neuron gets white, this trace goes up. When the neuron gets in, this goes down. You know, that's the that's representation of this for one neuron. And then you can, we, we, we can just calculate the first time derivative of these calcium transients and threshold it and have a binary representation of the activity of the neuron. So that's, and, and then you can do that for all the neuron. And on the right, you can see all the neurons at the same time. You know, this is a raster plot of all the neurons that were recorded in primary initial cortex of a mouse. Each row represents one neuron, and each column represents a frame, like a picture that we were taking. So this is a, a, the representation of all the population activity at the same time. Sometimes uh, uh, for neuroscience, this kind of raster plots represent many trials that you do in one neuron. So, so you can see also this kind of plot sometimes when people are recording just one neuron and repeating the same thing many, many times. So they do this kind of uh, uh, representation. But in this case, and in all the, the, the talk for today, this is showing actually population activity, not many, many trials. You see? So with this one, we can start to figure out how to make sense of all this information because we now have like almost 100 neurons and many, many frames. One thing we can do is a histogram of this activity. Just You just make a, a, a sum of all the, the activity that you have and, and we can have this histogram in, in the bottom part of the here. No? And this one represents when neurons get active at the same time. So if you have a group of neurons firing together in a given time window, you will see a peak of synchrony in this kind of histogram. And that was exactly the uh, definition of neuronal ensemble, a group of neurons firing together many times related to something, you see? So after we have this kind of representation, then we can start to use different mathematical approaches to extract the information that we have in, in these uh, uh, kind of experiments. One approach, again, there's many, many ways to do this, but one of the approaches is to think of this population activity that this now is exactly the same like, kind of raster plot here, but just with ones and zero. It's like a binary representation. Ones means that the, the neurons have bars of action potential. Zero means that neurons don't have any activity. And you can think of this as a multidimensional array where the dimensionality of these arrays is given by the number of neurons that we record. So if we have 100 neurons, we will have 100 dimensions, you see? And humans, especially us, no? After three dimensions, it's hard for our brains to <laughs> actually understand what's happening because we are like framing three dimensions. So 
Some people can start four dimensions, some mathematicians maybe five, but believe me, after six, seven dimensions, to visualize it flat on your brain is, is very, very, very tough. So, so we can actually use concept from linear algebra to try to understand these multidimensional arrays. And when we're talking about population vectors, you can think that these multidimensional population vectors are just like arrows pointing in a multidimensional space. That's the representation here on the right. Each arrow here is a population vector. Each, in this case, is each dot is a population vector, not a cell. These arrows represent just, it's just an, one example of these population vectors. And that means that some neurons are firing together at different times. So if you have a cluster of population vectors, that means that almost the same neurons fire together at different times, you see? If totally different neurons fire together, the cluster will be in a different place. And that's this representation that we have here, the blue, the black, and the red. Those represent kind of groups of neurons that are mostly the same neurons for the the specific color that we have there. So with this representation of multidimensional population vectors, then we can start to study how these groups of neurons represent specific things, in particular in these experiments, the visual uh, stimuli that the, the mice receive. And then we can figure out which neurons are important for the behavior and try to target those neurons with this Two photon optogenetics. So we use the laser, we split the beam, and we just target the neurons that are important for our behavior, and, and we can study what happened with the behavior. No? So that, that's a, a, a framework like a, that could be used for this kind of experiments. There are many others, there are many groups working on different approaches, uh, uh, but the one I will talk about today is just this one. We, we, we think about this in a very simplified way, just reduce all this activity to binary arrays, make those uh, multidimensional representations, and then study what happened with these, these groups of neurons. And we try to relate that to, to something that the, the mice is doing. So the first part we need to do is actually identify the ensemble, identify the groups of neurons that fight together. And one measurement that we can do for this is just to measure the angle between the population vector. So again, if the same group of neurons fire together at two different times, they will be pointing exactly to the same point in the multidimensional space. So that means that the angle between those population vectors will be zero, you see? If the, the groups of neurons are totally different, then the angle between them will be 90 degrees. They would, those, those, those are called orthogonal. So we can calculate actually the angles between all the possible combination of population vectors, and then try to figure out what's happening with the uh, activity of the network. And we can create this kind of uh, similarity maps on the right side. This is a similarity map. It's just the angles of all the population vectors plot in a graph. And for example, this is a, a, a very interesting approach because if you record all this activity, let's say someone of you are recording population activity and, and you gave me that, you, you tell me, Luis, I want to see if there's something about ensembles in this data. You can just give me that. You don't tell me anything that you do. And I can just do this population vector approach and I can tell you, oh, look, probably in this specific times in the red, in the red like a circle, the, the animal was doing exactly the same thing. So for the experiment of visual stimuli, probably you were showing the animal the same pattern in the monitor. You see, you, you didn't even tell me what you did. You didn't, you, you didn't need to tell me what did you show or when, but that with this kind of approach, I can tell you this specific times you were showing something that must be pretty similar, you know? So how can we actually extract that with mathematical tools? Because if I just put red circles there, uh, and I try to convince a referee that you show the mice the same thing, the referee will reject the paper. So we can actually decompose, factorize these similarity maps using a technique called singular value decomposition. 
And with this technique, I, I, I took this technique from the pro image, image processing. So you can have a, just imagine you have a picture of something and then you can separate that pictures in many factors. You can, you can have the contours, you can have the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel. And if you put all those pictures together, you have the original one. So SVD is, is, so, is doing something similar. This, this algorithm is used to compress information. So you can separate an image in many factors and then just take the factors that are more important for the variance of your image. And with that, we, we found that each factor of this singular variable composition was representing a specific orientation that we were showing to the mouse. So if we show vertical bars, we will have some pattern in these similarity maps. If we show horizontal bars, we, we have a different pattern of this similarity map. So with this, this approach, we were able actually to identify the ensembles, the groups of neurons related, in this case, to a specific visual stimuli. And uh, you, you can think, if some, sometimes uh, I, I got like the comment that, Luis, but that's trivial, because if you show, if, if there's some uh, tone in, in, in neurons of primary visual cortex, so every time that you show the same thing, the same neuron will fight. But that's not really true when the animals are awake and moving. You know, in the human and visceral experiments, when the cats are anesthetized and you just, put down an electrode and you stop your electrode when the neuron responds to specific orientation, then of course you have the same response many, many times for the same neuron. But when the animal is, is, is moving and you have uh, all these different variables and you are not choosing just one neuron because it was very, very tuned to your stimuli, then you have a lot of variability in the response. You see, so sometimes the same neurons fire in different orientations, sometimes uh, when you show the same orientation, the neuron will fire, and sometimes the, the neuron will not fire, but some others will fire. As, and as a group, the representation of that orientation is very, very stable. So that's, that's the, the, the important thing with this uh, identification of neuronal ensembles. That is not a trivial like, problem. And we show that with this approach, you can actually see a group of neurons. These are uh, spatial maps of neurons that are active when we were showing vertical bars, horizontal bars, or bars like in different orientations. The black uh, circles here represent neurons that are active and that were very robustly activated when we show exactly the same orientation, you see? And in, in, especially also in, in, in the primary visual cortex of mice, you, we, we don't have like a columnar organization. So all the neurons that represent different orientations are kind of spread all, all around the, the visual cortex. That's also something that made this identification very challenging for, for mice. Uh, why I'm saying this because in monkeys or in cats, the neurons that respond to a specific orientation are kind of arranged anatomically in the same column, but that doesn't happen in mice. Uh, so that was something kind of interesting also. Okay, so I, I hope I, I convince you that we can identify groups of neurons. Yeah. Oh. Ah. That we can identify groups of neurons. So the next, the next question that I have is, okay, we can identify these groups of neurons, that's cool, but, but what else? No, so we, we cannot do one experiment with that. So, so what else we can do? And, and, and in order to manipulate with very high spatial precision, we need some tools that uh, allow us to do that. So I will talk to you about now optogenetics with high spatial resolution. 90% of the experiments that uh, optogenetic experiments nowadays, they use 1P stimulation. That means one photon stimulation. And you stimulate a volume of neurons. You can activate a volume of neurons, but you don't know which neurons you are activated. You don't have control over that. With two photon, uh, two P uh, optogenetic stimulation, you can actually target which neurons you, you want to activate. So the, the first thing we needed to show is that you can actually just activate one neuron. So this experiment, uh, I'm showing the responses of one neuron to visual stimulation. And we calibrated the laser, the amplitude and the power and the duration of the laser to 
create responses for the optogenetic stimulation that have the same amplitude of the responses evolved by visual stimulation. Because if, if not, then we are doing something that is not like uh, normal for the brain, let's say. No? So after we calibrate that, we can actually target one neuron and see the responses in all the other neurons. So for example, here, I'm targeting neuron one and I'm also recording the responses in all these other neurons. Then I switch and just target neuron two and then just target neuron four and then neuron five. And, and so on. So you can see that we, we, we actually have a very high spatial resolution activation because every time that we target a specific neuron, we just see the activation of that neuron and not the other neurons. Yeah. Is that animal under uh, anesthesia? No, this was also awake and moving, freely moving. Yeah. 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 Okay. So with this, I, I, I hope I convince you that we actually have a good spatial resolution. Sometimes, especially for these experiments that are already kind of old, uh, the expression of the opsin was not restricted to the soma of the, near, of the neuron. So it was also expressed sometimes in the dendrites. So sometimes if, if, if we stimulate around 40 microns from the soma of one neuron, sometimes we can see some responses. But even though 40 microns from a neuron that, that has like 20 microns of uh, <clears throat> diameter is, is pretty good. Nowadays, you can, you can restrict the expression of the uh, opsin just to the soma, so, so this resolution is even higher. So we can also stimulate the same neuron for an hour, and we can get similar responses. So that means that this stimulation is not killing the neurons, and you can reliably activate the same neuron many, many times. And you can even modulate the amplitude of the response just changing the laser power. No? So, so, so this is to show you that this is actually a very robust technique with very high spatial resolution. So the next question I had was like, okay, I can identify ensembles for one, one side. I can also target the specific neurons with very high spatial resolution. So, I had the question that if I can actually create artificial ensemble, you know, and, and I, I had this question because Hepp, you know, Hepp in 1949, he proposed this in his first postulate. He said that uh, he was proposing how ensembles can be created. And he said that if you have two neurons that are close to each other and you made these two neurons fire many, many times, something will happen between those neurons. And then if you fire one of those, the probability to see the other active will be increased. That, that was the, the head postulate like in 1949. At that point, many things were not very clear about synaptic uh, connectivity and potentiation and all these things. But he proposed this uh, postulate that has been used by many neuroscientists after that. But the experimental demonstration that that was actually happening uh, was not, uh, out because there was not a technique to actually show that that was happening or not because we, we didn't have this kind of high spatial resolution stimulation and recording approach. So, so my working hypothesis was that if I can stimulate the same group of neurons many times, then I will create a group between those neurons that some, something will happen in those neurons that they will be now linked together and fired together. Um, so that's exactly what I did. And um, here I, I can show you the experiment. I'm stimulating the same group of neurons many, many times. You can see every time that the neurons fire is because I was turning on the laser. On the right is a representation of, of this experiment. The bars are where I was turning on the laser. You can see that especially these neurons that, uh, that I, I'm showing here, they respond Every time I, I was turning on the laser, every time they respond, they respond, they respond. I, I need to say that these neurons, before I did this, they never fired together. These were not part of these ensembles that respond to vertical bars or horizontal bars. I chose randomly the neurons that never fired together uh, in any of the conditions. Yeah. What kind of neurons should be, be here? Um, are they pyramidal or inhibitory or? Oh, yeah. So, 
the, I, I didn't mention that the ops the opsin is the the virus that that we use to put the opsin into the cells have the CAM KT promoter. So we are just stimulating pyramidal neurons, excitatory neurons. The GCAM it has synapsin uh, prom promoter. So you can see also interneurons and pyramidal neurons. But for the stimulation, we just have uh, excitatory neurons. Yeah, it's, it's CAM K2 alpha. Uh, so, so you can see that we can actually stimulate the same group of neurons many, many times. And these neurons didn't fire together before. So that the, the thing that was surprising for us, and, and we were very excited about that, is that after we stimulated the same group of neurons that never fire together many, many times, and we just watch the spontaneous activity, we record the spontaneous activity of these neurons, no visual simulation, no optogenetic simulation, those neurons would start to fire together. You know, we, we saw that in these periods of time, you know, the same neurons that we made fire together artificially, they started to fire together. And even though we can, with this, with, with this kind of technique, you can go and see the same neurons the next day and many days after, because you, you know where the neurons are. And we saw that even after two days of the stimulation, the same neurons kept firing together. So with that, we can uh, suggest that we actually create a new group of neurons into the brain of the mouse in the visual cortex. What that means, we, we don't know. No, the mouse cannot tell us, oh, we, we are seeing this stuff, no? But we think that they are actually seeing something. Yeah. Yeah, so this on day two, these are spontaneous firing, not any stimulation. There's no stimulation. No, this is a spontaneous. Mm -hmm. yes. So I did the, the stimulation protocol here, like the training protocol, activating these all these neurons at the same time many, many times. And then I record the spontaneous activity the same day. And then I let the mouse like go to sleep or do whatever they do. And then I record just a spontaneous activity without any visual or optogenetic mm -hmm. stimuli, and, and the same neurons were firing together. Yeah. For how long did you uh, make the experiment? How long did you uh, stimulate? Uh, so in, in order to have this, you need to stimulate at least like 60 times. That means around like uh, 30 minutes to one hour of stimulation. Okay. It was actually pretty fast. That was enough for to see the... Yeah, that was enough. See, if, if we stimulated less than 60 times, we didn't see the next day the activation, and we didn't see the first day like many repetitions of this and some more. We at least need 60 times. Yeah. yeah. Are mice the only animals they've done this experiment on? So far, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a, a lot of, of people trying to do this in uh, non-human primates, but still for 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 monkeys or, uh, or, or this kind of non-human primates, it's very hard to express reliably the opsins and the indicators. Now, there, there's, there's more advances in that now, but at this time, uh, it was uh, for some reason, I don't know, the immune system or something, the, the, the expression of the viruses is not, it's not very good in monkeys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you see uh, the if this artificial ensemble uh, was reactivated during the sleep? No, we actually didn't see that. I, I think that, that that's a cool experiment. I, I don't have that data yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's the likelihood of picking 20 or 30 neurons just randomly and having them fire together proportionally as often as these ones are? Like, what's the baseline? for 20 random neurons in visual cortex having some synchrony and activity over the length of this amount of recording. So, yeah, I, I told you these ones that we may fire together, they never fire together normally. If you just record the spontaneous activity in the visual cortex, you can actually see groups of neurons that fire together and form ensembles. And actually those groups of neurons are the same ones that you activate with visual stimulation. So, so without anything, without the, the optogenetic stimulation, the visual cortex in an awake mouth with spontane with no images, you, you are not showing anything, they, they have this kind of uh, ensemble uh, patterns of activity. That's why we, we know that these, these ones that, that we 
forced to fire together, never fire fire together before. Yeah. That that's the way we, we knew. Yeah. There was some, uh, yeah. So if you uh, accumulate, let's say 20% of the cells in one of the ensembles, do you get the completion of the remaining ones? Oh, that, I, I will talk about that just in the next slide, but for specifically this experiment with more than 60 repeats of the stimulation. And with these artificial ones, we're, we were able to recall them somewhat just with one neuron. So if we, we, we can find neurons that are able to bring back the whole pattern. We call those pattern completion neurons. So, and just one for this experiment was, was enough. Yeah. Wow. We, I, I show an image later of that, yeah. So if you're stimulating these all at the same time, and in, what you're saying is they're likely connect, strengthening connections to each other, Kind of, then shouldn't they, rather than firing simultaneously, be firing in sequence? Because you're giving, you're training them basically with a top down unison stimulus. But if we're talking about spontaneous activity, shouldn't one activate and start to recruit the rest of them in a less temporally coordinated way? Does that make sense? So that's a possibility. Okay. But in particular for these experiments, where the temporal resolution is very low, it's four hertz, then we don't know in, if in that 250 millisecond time window, we have a sequential pattern of activity. Uh, I, I, I actually had that question way before, like a year before I was doing these experiments, uh, and I will, I will show some something uh, in a more like a, a control preparation. No, yeah, not in vivo. But yeah, uh, I think uh, there are kind of different scales in sequential activity patterns. For this one I'm talking about is like in this 250 millisecond. Uh, but <clears throat> that I will not talk about stuff secret. Uh, well, I can tell you this. So, so <laughs> when you train an animal, you know, and, and the animal is, is an expert, you start to see <laughs> sequential activity pattern. No, so that are related to the image, the, the, the stimuli that triggers the go signal and the behavior, and some others are related to the reward, and some others are related to the movement itself. And you start to see that you form a sequential pattern between all those and some more. But in particular, in this, in this time of 250 milliseconds, those represent pretty much like some part of the task that you are doing, like the visual stimuli, the movement, the leaking, the reward, and all this stuff. Yeah. But but I think also that in inside that 250 millisecond window, you have also some kind of sequential patterns of activity in some other uh, scales also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have you observed a single neuron fire with multiple ensembles? Yeah, we, we actually the, the first time we we uh, characterized these ensembles, I did that in uh, the striatum, but in slices, striatal slices, and we found that uh, the neurons that fire in many ensembles are mostly interneuron. That's 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 pretty cool because that that means the 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 role of the interneurons is kind of linking the activity of different uh, projection neurons and ensembles and making maybe some interneurons can make sequential activity patterns like we were talking about and some others can be related to the synchronization of the group. No, I think probably nobody is still. Have done the experiment, but I, I think many people is, is behind that idea now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in these particular uh, experiments, uh, because I wanted to stimulate a specific groups of neurons that can bring back just one ensemble, I did like a pre-processing step where I uh, get rid of the neurons that are in all the ensembles at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I think those are very interesting, and and I'm finding now in the, in the experiments I'm doing now uh, that these neurons that participate in many many ensembles are related to 
different properties of the ensembles, like the pattern completion, pattern separation, and, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, those those are very interesting. Even, so, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. How many days can you see this ensemble? I saw this for almost one week. Wow. After four or five days, this this is not as reliable as the, the first and the second day. That was also very yeah, surprising. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it, it tells you that there's something that you really mess up in the brain. Or, or, or put in the brain of the, of the mice. Yeah. So this is a, the, the experiment. Uh, so, so the question now was, OK, if we are creating this new ensemble, can we reactivate ensemble just by stimulating a specific members of the ensemble? And, and, and in this, this is like I'm, I'm showing you the activation of just one neuron. I was targeting this neuron and before I did anything else to the mouse. And you can see that we just activate this neuron. That's why it's more red, because every time I activate a neuron that fires, and, and then the second time that I activate that, probably, you know, this one also fires. But the third time that I activate, the, the, this neuron uh, got active and maybe this one, and the fourth time this neuron got active and maybe this other one, but never all these neurons at the same time. I think you, if you can see this, these are, are more like a uh, red dim. They are very close to this one. So, so probably sometimes I saw the activation of this because uh, the overlap of the dendrites, you know, but it was not very reliable that every time that I activated this neuron, some other group will be active. So, we have, I, I had this experiment. So, so the way to see if we can actually recall an ensemble that we create and we, we put into the brain of the mouse was to, after this, just activate many neurons many, many times and then target this neuron again. And what happened was I did this, I, I stimulate randomly again, many neurons, like more than 60 times. And when I turn on this one again, all these other that are in red, they got active. So that means that we were able to recall this in some mode just by the activation of one neuron. These neurons that are able to bring back the pattern are not all the neurons. So some, some neurons cannot bring back the whole pattern. Uh, these neurons, uh, we, we use a probabilistic graphical model that is called conditional random fields to find these neurons that have this pattern completion capabilities. And 90% and of, the of the neurons that the model tells us, oh, these neurons will bring back the pattern, they actually can bring back the pattern. Yeah? So um, I think I will tell you about this probabilistic graphical model in a couple of slides. So, so we were able to actually bring back the ensemble just by the activation of one neuron. You can think of this pattern completion as, as a property of many parts of the brain. You know, like, for example, if I was showing an image of uh, a bicycle here, no? And, and I, leave, I, I leave the image of the bicycle for, again, like three hours and, and I made you, like, don't open your eyes. And, and then I remove 99% of the image and, and I show you just some pixels. And then I ask you, what's this? You will tell me, oh, this is a bicycle, you know? But if I do the other way, first just show you some pixels without ever showing you the bicycle and ask you, oh, what's this? You, you will not be able to tell me, no, that's a bicycle. So, so the, the brain kind of do this pattern completion things all the time, not just for static things, but also for sequential, like uh, organization of behaviors and stuff. You know? So, so um, we show that primary visual cortex actually had this property that that, that, that was also something uh, that uh, was kind of surprising for us when, when we found that uh, we were very happy with. We, we, we were able to try this thing in primary visual cortex. Uh, and our idea is that we kind of, when we activate these groups of neurons many, many times, we are increasing the connectivity between these neurons. Now, that's, that's, that, that was our working hypothesis. And we proposed that working hypothesis. We, at, at least I think in this experiment, we were not creating new connections between the neurons, uh, at least with the parameters that we were using, the stimulation parameters that were on the physiological range. You know? Maybe we really 
hit hard the neurons, we can create more connections between them. Uh, it was shown by other group a couple of years before this, that in primary visual cortex, the neurons that encode the same visual pattern, they are actually connected together. No? And our hypothesis was that these neurons we increase the connectivity between those neurons because, because I did like a couple of years before some experiments trying to figure out the connectivity, the, the uh, short term synaptic dynamics between the ensembles. So the experiment that I did back, this, this was back in Japan. I, I had a culture of neurons, py pyramidal neurons. I culture them and then I can do calcium imaging and electrophysiology at the same time. You know, so we first identify the ensemble because these cultures of neurons they have a spontaneous activity and they also show uh, ensemble dynamic groups of neurons that fire together and then fire together again and fire together again. And then I, I can do pair recordings of the neurons that belong to an ensemble. So the neurons that fire together in the calcium imaging they have this type of connectivity. This is called uh, short term synaptic depression. That means that that connection is strong. So that's why we, we, we were thinking that when we create an ensemble, we were just making uh, the connections that already are in the brain is stronger, you see? Um, probably there's also some other mechanisms, intrinsic mechanisms, but uh, in vivo, it's very hard to do this experiment. So to keep a, a pair of neurons and then do many, many trials and then see how is the connectivity, that's, that's kind of, no, um, we try what we fail, but in the culture, you, you can actually do it very, very easily. But did, did you get all paired uh, connectivity to yield depression? To, in other words, do, do you see some type of potentiation in these pair connectivity experiments? In these ones, I was not stimulating. I see. Yes. I see. So, but, but yeah, so I, 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 I didn't tell you about this, but when you have the neurons that are part of the ensemble, they have short term synaptic depression. They fire together, but we, we also studied the neurons that are in a sequence. So ensemble A and B, and we patch those neurons also. And the connectivity between those neurons is short-term synaptic depress, uh, facilitation. facilitation. Yeah. So that's a so weak connection that gets bigger. Yeah. So that, uh, that make us propose that short-term synaptic depression is, is there to create the synchrony and short term synaptic facilitation is more related to sequential activity pattern. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. You, you, that, that, that experiment was, was very, uh, very clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was clear. So the last question that we have is okay, we are putting this new uh, group, this new ensemble into the brain of the animals. Are we messing up with all the other ensembles that were already there? So to, 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 to show what, what's happening, so we show to the animals vertical and horizontal bars before the optogenetic training, and then we show the same patterns and record the same neurons after. And the thing that we found, the, this red, red line, is not that I just stimulate in that one second. It, I, I just cut the recording because if not, you will see just the same neurons firing, firing together. No? Uh, but that's like uh, 60 minutes of the stimulation. That, that red bar represents like 60 minutes of stimulation. And we found that with these parameters that we can create new ensembles, we didn't mess up with the original ensembles that are there. So before and after, the same neurons that encode the vertical bars are the same ones that encode the vertical bar after the stimulation, and the same that encode the horizontal ones are the ones that encode after. So, so we, we, we were not really messing up other things in there. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, shouldn't, isn't that now what you expect if you're training a network to be reactivated and activating some population, some the portion that are vertical bar responsive, shouldn't that recruit um, some of that trained population as well? I think this happened because again, those neurons that we uh, activate together were not part of this other ensemble. You know, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's why I think we didn't see that. The other interesting thing is that if you have a mouse that is not trained at all, you show these vertical and horizontal bars in a passive way, you cannot recall that ensemble. For example, we try to 
to identify the neurons that can recall ensembles for the vertical bars in, in an animal that is not trained at all. And uh, it, 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 we, we were not able to bring back the, the, the pattern in non-trained animals. I will talk about in a couple of that in a trained animal, you can actually do it, but in an untrained animal, we were not able to do the pattern completion with the original patterns of activity, let's say. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then that means that so in, in other words, the artificial ensemble um is not relating to nothing important for yeah. the mouse at the moment. At this moment, yeah, it's not related to nothing and it's not messing up anything. So that means that you can actually kind of reprogram some kind of part of the ensembles in the brain without affecting the other. That that's something that uh, if we want to translate this in decades to the humans or something, that means that you will not be messing up like everything. Yeah? The, the other in, interesting thing is we, we think that the, the mice see something with these new patterns because there are some experiments like back, back, back then, after the uh, Second World War, uh, there were like a lot of injured people, you know, people that used to see, and then they lost the sight. But, and, and, and back then, the, the, one of the approaches to try to restore the vision was to put electrodes in visual cortex. And then they put like hundreds of electrodes in these in this patients. And when they stimulate like different patterns of the electrodes, the, the patients can tell you, oh, I'm seeing like a red, uh, uh, like some white spot here, or I'm seeing like a white spot there, no? Or if you do like a really strong activation, they, they, will, they will tell you, oh, I'm seeing lines moving in this way. So, so that's why we think that probably the, the, the mice were seeing something there, that, but we cannot talk too much, so, so we don't know. You know? Uh, we didn't pursue the trying to train the mice to do something with this specific ensemble, but I think that's also possible to do, you know? And then you know that that means something for the, for the animals. So. Yeah. And also, sorry, I am I'm thinking that you can make disappear one ensemble that is actually related with the uh, animal behavior, right? Yeah, that's those, those experiments. I, I propose those to Rafa. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think a postdoc now is doing that now. Yeah. But, but those experiments are kind of tricky because, because you have all this variability in the ensemble. So, so now you need to, to find the neurons that are very reliably active, then relate that to a specific behavior, and then erase that and erase the behavior. So it's, it's kind of like a long experiment. But, but I think now he's trying with a. Yeah, not Mexican post that over there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think probably soon he will probably something else. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but that's 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 an experiment. Try to erase these things because sometimes for many pathologies, you don't want that like a very robust ensemble that is activating all, all the time. Uh, you want to erase that thing, but but yeah, those those experiments are still not published yet. Yeah, yeah. So Okay, now I show you that we can identify ensembles, we can target specific neurons, we can create new ensembles. But again, uh, you can tell me, oh, yeah, yeah this, that's cool, but, <laughs> but, but what? <laughs> so, so, so the next step that I wanted to do is actually try to use all these, these tools to prove that there's a causal relation between the activity of the specific groups of neurons and the behavior. So in order to do that, we train some uh, mice to lick when we when they see vertical bars. This is an extra mouse. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the hemispheres, you can see they can move. And the microscope is just over there. You know? and, and then you see with, with we show, uh, when we show horizontal bars, the, the mouse the top doesn't care. The, the, then we show again vertical bars and uh, well, or horizontal bars and the mouse doesn't care again. This is random, like the vertical and horizontal. Wow. And then uh, we show the vertical bars. And, yeah. and then the mouse started leaking oh, wow. again. No? So, so when I, I started these experiments, Rafa told me, Luis, you are crazy. The mice are dumb. You, know, you cannot <laughs> train those things. 
And uh, but we actually were able to to make this happen, and and you just need to be patient and control the weight and and talk. So is, is the walking to... also? Uh, is that? I mean, is that just this video or? or... Yeah, that that's just this video. Okay. It's not really related yeah. to the to the leaking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they work when they see the horizontal. Sometimes they work when they see the vertical. Yeah. So, so with this one, I, I'm showing that we can actually train mice now. Uh, because some people told me also that you should do that with rats, not with mice, because rats are more smart. Um, but the point with the rats at that point is that uh, it, it's very, it was very hard to to do some uh, genetic manipulation. Now, now you can also do opsins and. Uh, you can with, with rats, but that, that, back in the day, I mean, I started this experiment in 2014, so, so back in the day, we, we didn't have that, that option. So, but, but well, we were able to train these, these ones, and then um, we can measure the performance. You know? If the animal leaks when they see the vertical bars, that's a hit. If they don't leak, that's a miss. If the animals leak when they see the horizontal bars, they don't need to leak, but they leak. That's a false, false choice. And if they don't leak when they see the horizontal, that's a correct rate. And with these, these four parameters, we can calculate the performance of the mice. And you see in this graph that after around 10 <laughs> sessions, they, they have a very good performance. Actually, they, they, they actually learn this and they, that's stable for, for even months if you keep training the mouse to just keeping them happy and, and in the same uh, kind of. Uh, environment so so then we can train these these mice this becomes very very robust and we found that there's a specific ensemble that was very robustly activated for the go signal so every time that we show the vertical bars and the animal did the task correctly we saw that this group of neurons will activate together you know many many times we, uh, uh, when the, the, the animal was already an expert, the, another interesting thing that happened is that the no-go signal became very weak. You know, in, in a non-trained animal, as I showed you before, when you show vertical bars, you see a group of neurons that fire with the vertical bars. When, when you show horizontal bars, you see another group of neurons that fire with the horizontal bars. But in a trained animal, when, when the vertical bars are relevant for the behavior and the survival because the animals are thirsty, you see a very, very strong ensemble for the go signal with less variability than non, a non-trained mouse. But the no-go signal doesn't matter anymore. Sometimes you see three ensembles for the no-go signal. Sometimes you don't see responses for the no-go signal. It's like the, the, the mouse is just trying for the go go signal and, and the, everything else doesn't matter you know that, that's also, also very very interesting uh, but we found this ensemble this go ensemble and then we can use uh, this paradigm try, trying to see if we can actually do something with that ensemble that is very very robust so we can identify the neurons of the go ensemble and then we can target just a percentage of the go ensemble and see if we can actually now recall the ensemble and make the animal do something. So with, with the spatial light modulator, you see? So we did this, we did this experiment. Uh, when we target just one neuron, we were never able to uh, reliably recall the ensemble. So we, need, at least for this experiment, we needed two neurons that had pattern completion capabilities to bring back the whole ensemble and make the animal do the behavior. Yeah. And the, this is especially this behavior. I, I like the, the visual cortex paradigm because you can move the contrast of the images and control the performance of your animal. You know, you, if you have an expert animal that have a performance above 80%, you can just load the contrast, reduce the contrast that you are showing in the image. And you can make the animal perform at the at sixty percent, you know, because if you have already an animal that is performing very high and you activate these neurons, you will not be able to see any difference. So that's exactly what uh, to find these neurons that are the pattern completion neurons. We use this probabilistic graphical model, 
that is just telling you the conditional probability to see one neuron firing given that a specific group of neurons fire together at the same time. We published this in, in this neural neuroscience and they liked my art and they put it there. Um, but but this this uh, this model was 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 pretty like uh, useful for this kind of experiments because now we can choose a specific neurons and we have parameters and, and, and metrics to that can tell us, oh, these neurons are the important one. Yeah. So we, we use this model, we found these pattern completion neurons, and then we reduce the contrast of the visual stimuli. And when we reduce the contrast of the visual stimuli, we saw that the animal from 80% performance, they went to 60% performance. But when we reactivate the goal signal, so we are showing the vertical, the, the, the goal stimuli, vertical bars. And at the same time, we activate two neurons with pattern completion capabilities. So we were able to recall the whole ensemble, the original ensemble, and the animal performance went up. Like if they are actually seeing the image with high contrast, you know, when you reduce the contrast of the visual simulation, you see less neurons uh, active that were originally part of the goal ensemble. But when you activate this pattern completion here, you recall the original Go ensemble that we saw very robustly activated when the, the mice performed correctly. And we, can, we were able to increase the performance of the animal. And uh, so this was cool no? because we can actually now show that the activation of these neurons are actually related to the performance of the animal. Yes. If you do the reverse and activate the wrong ensemble and reduce the behavioral performance? The, the thing, I, I didn't do the yeah. inactivation, like, like using yeah. an opsin that will shut down the neurons, but the experiment I did was to show the vertical bars with high contrast and target randomly other neurons that are not part of that ensemble. Uh -huh. And when, that, when we did that, the animal performance went down. Yeah, so we, we interrupted also the, the, the performance by targeting yeah. randomly other neurons. That, that was also very like a robust like a experiment. The, interest, the, the interesting thing with that experiment was that when we target, at the same time that we were showing the visual stimuli, we, we target random, a random set of neurons. We saw that some of those go in some of neurons uh, got shut down that as, as in, the the network has some level of activity before recruiting the interneurons and shutting everything down. Yeah. So so yeah, we did that. The inactivation by using some inactivation of some video. Yeah. But that one we did, and we saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also the uh, yeah. Well, this is really cool. So um, when you try to identify these pattern completion neurons, are you uh, do you always identify two or a different numbers? So in general, it's, it was around 5%, 5% of the ensemble. So usually the ensembles are like uh, 25 to 30 neurons. So that means that we have two or three neurons there uh, that can be uh, pattern completion ones. So in this visual stimuli, when you use a different bars to, uh, to, to get this ensemble, is the ensemble neurons the population is always in a similar number or sometimes it's a very small number, say five or five or six, or sometimes there's like 20 or 30. So is the number always a similar number of- uh, You mean in trained mice or in non-trained Non-trained mice. The in ensemble are always in a similar number. Yeah, especially for, for a visual uh, field of 250 by 250, just one, one plane. It's around the same, like 20 to 30 neurons. Yeah. I see. So may I ask, um, why, uh, why do you choose layer two and three instead of without a layer four, which is more like a primary input from LGN? So they, does, uh, is that a reason? Yeah, layer two, three has more connectivity between them. So all these, okay. the, the, the collaterals and the, the recurrent connections that we think are the basis of the ensemble activity. The other thing that's more technical is uh, when you use these uh, normal uh, adenoviruses to infect the cortex, for some reason, 
you know, if you put the this this ABB one or ABB two or, or, or nine or what, all, all of these that are normally used for the the cortex, and you you inject that in all the cortex, like all the layers, you always see like a dark zone in layer four. <laughs> so you need a special promoter to label layer four. Yeah, yeah. yeah some some others. Um, we were doing these experiments, and at the same time, another group, like famous uh, uh, group, were doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. We, we disclosed this since 2015. They didn't say anything <laughs> before, just when they told it. We knew they were doing that. Um, but they also, they stimulate also layer five. And when you stimulate layer five, the, the exit of this thing, uh, you can also make the animal perform uh, better yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah but layer four uh, yeah we didn't do it because pretty much uh I, I think the 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 recurrent connectivity and the processing of the the ensembles is, is happening in layer layer two three and also because of this like we, we don't see we cannot see layer four because they are not labeled <laughs> right mm -hmm. so all these are done with train bikes okay this second part yeah. okay so because I was just wondering how this, how um, the Go ensembles could possibly improve learning behavior of untrained. Oh, so so this Go ensembles now are also working, and that is that top secret. But we saw some top secret. But we are trying to figure out how this pattern completion ensembles form with the training. Because for these experiments, I use recorded before the training and after they were expert. Now we are following like the whole mm -hmm. thing and trying to figure out how this go ensemble that is related to behavior actually uh, emerged no, from this all, all this training. Um, but before, uh, so so this, this go ensemble, as I, I, I told you, uh, uh, but as I, I, I told your, your other, uh, this other guy, um, is this, at, at least we think is it, now when the animal is an expert animal, is is not just related to the visual stimulation. It has some other things. Uh, it, it's encoding some other things that, that we need to also to figure out. Yeah. So we cannot identify these expert goal ensembles in non-trained mice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so so the other experiment that that we can we can do is not just lower the contrast, but actually stimulate these neurons. What we we were showing just like a dark screen to the animal. You know? So in this experiment, I target this the these pattern completion neurons when we were showing just dark screen a dark screen to the animal, and we were able to recall the pattern the the whole ensemble. And every time that we recall the ensemble, the animal leak. So that means that this, this group of neurons, when they get active, the animal is just like wired now to, to do the, the behavior. And also like a very interesting, very, something that was very interesting is, is that we can also just record the activity of the mouse uh, without doing anything, like not engage in the task. And sometimes in the spontaneous activity, you can see these go ensembles go on. So spontaneously, the ensemble will just turn on and the mouse, even if they didn't have the leaking port, they will start leaking. You know, like this was so, so high, like a uh, wire that in an expert mouse, even if he's just there, like running around, when this, this, this ensemble activates spontaneously, they start leaking. So that, that shows that probably that, that experiment that someone was asking, when they are sleeping, these are really like also reactivating all the time. You know? uh, so that was also something very like uh, impressive that, that we were surprised that this, this was so, so strong that even without the mouse engaged in the, in the task, they will leak when the, the, the ensemble got, got, got active spontaneously. Um, and finally, do we have still time? Yeah. Quick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so finally, we'll talk about some some uh, some research of these neurons, some in pathological conditions, um, and uh, we show 
this this experiment back also in 2008 uh, in the slices of mice in the striatum that there's some ensemble activity also in the striatal neurons and they have these specific groups of neurons that are active in sequential activity patterns also and uh, that we can identify with some analy analytical tools um, that are related to reducing the dimensionality of the data. No? So, so we show that we we have different ensembles for different experimental conditions, and we our question was okay if, if we have this ensemble dynamics in the striatum, can we actually see differences when we have a Parkinsonian mice? So we create this model. Well, we, we didn't create. We we did this model of Parkinsonian mouse where we inject six hydroxy dopamine in the substantia nigra. This is a toxin that uh, is very specific for dopaminergic neurons. So when you inject that in, in the substantia nigra, it will kill the dopaminergic neurons, as you can see here. This is uh, uh, immunofluorescence for TH. You see the oxidase that, that labels dopaminergic neurons. And in the injected side of this 6 hydroxy dopamine, you don't see any neurons opposed, as opposed to the other side that is not injected. So this mouse, uh, the, the behavior correlate of killing the dopaminergic neurons in one side of the brain is that they turn ipsilaterally. They turn ipsilaterally, so you know that you actually lesion this substan substantia neuron. No? If you don't target this correctly, they, they don't turn. No? And also, when you inject some dopaminergic agonist, the mouse uh, start turning contralaterally. And depending on how many turns they do, you know that you kill 80% or 90% of the neurons in the substantia nigra. Yeah. So, so we have this model, and then we can study what happened in the extraital activity. And we saw also this is also on a slice. So we made the animal Parkinsonian, we slice the brain, and we saw the activity in the striatum, and we found that. Parkinsonian animals, uh, they have this engagement of ensembles. Let, let, just, just think about this. If, if uh, the, striatum is, the striatum is related to movements and initiation of movements and sequential activity patterns, that's what people say. So if, if I'm moving my hand in this way, let's say, probably one group of neurons will be active. Group, the, the ensemble A will be active with my hand is here. Then ensemble B will be active with my hand is here. And ensemble C will be active with my hand is here. And if I'm doing this, the, the waxing, karate, uh, so I, I, I will have like ABC, ABC, ABC all the time, you know, and I can move because I have different ensembles firing in sequences. And we found in the Parkinsonian mice that all the ensembles fire together all the time. So you don't have any more sequential activity patterns. Everything is engaged. So that actually correlates pretty well with the movement because now if I make all the in some of fire, I cannot move. And that's what's happening in Parkinsonian uh, mice and in, and in Parkinson's disease. No? So we found that this disengagement of the ensembles in Parkinsonian mice that actually gets disengaged when you put a dopaminergic agonist. So in this in this graph, uh, okay, let me tell you again what's this graph. So this is the the um, similarity maps, the ones I showed with the population vector, and this on the right is a dimensional reduction of the population vector. So each cluster here represents the number of population vectors that are active at different times, and the arrows show the transitions. So the thing you can see in Parkinsonian mice is that many, there, there's many uh, population vectors just in one spot. That means that the same neurons fire together at different times, many, many times. You see, like all these blue, Dots. That means that the same neurons are firing together at different times, once and once and once and again. That's why the ensembles are kind of uh, engaged, like they are like playing, like they're recording, like all the time at the same time. You know, um, when we put a dopaminergic agonist, now you see we can disengage this, uh, uh, like the activation of the same group of neurons, and we create more sequential activity patterns. And these dopaminergic agonists are used in the clinic to uh, kind of uh, alleviate the symptoms of Parkinson's. No? So, so we were showing a correlate of 
ensembles and ensemble dynamics in a Parkinsonian mice and with dopaminergic agonists. So, so the next thing I wanted to try to figure out, you know, is that okay, if we, could, if we eventually want to, to use these kind of tools to try to rescue these ensembles that are engaged and, and cause that the animals cannot move or, or move like in, in, the, in the case of the mouse, like just move in one direction. First, we need to understand how the neuromodulation of, of if we can actually have a tool to do some kind of neuromodulation of dopamine with light, no? So, so to do that, uh, we did this experiment this are from, from my lab already uh, now, um, where we have this cage dopamine, it's called Ruby Dopa. So it's, it's the molecule of dopamine that has a bipyridine in like a ruthenium cage. So when you inject that in the mouse, the dopamine cannot interact with dopaminergic receptors, but when you shine light, you break that cage and then you can release dopamine just with the, the light. No? So we, we can actually use also optical methods to release dopamine and in very controlled conditions. So we did that and we, to do that, we inject this ruby dopa just in the, uh, the striatum that is lesion, and then with a fiber optic, we turn on the light, we release the dopamine just temporarily and measure what the animal is doing. And we saw that ruby dopa, this, these are the trajectories of the mice. When you activate in a Parkinsonian mouse, when you put dopaminergic agonists, they start to turn contralaterally, as I told you. So in the trajectory, you see that they stay in the same time because they are turning, no? And when we use ruby dopa and activate the light, the mouse start turning contralaterally also. This was also kind of surprising because usually the uh, dopaminergic agonists are systemic. You know, you inject that intraperitoneal or, or in humans, you take a pill uh, with L-dopa. And, but we delivering dopamine just in the striatum with light very precisely and in control uh, manner with time, we can also recreate these contralateral movements. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the next question was, what, what is happening with the activation, with the population activity? So we did some uh, recordings of the activity of the striatum, and we saw that Ruby Dopa is actually disengaged the, the activity in the striatum. Yeah, Here, I thought it touched the tent, did I know? Potentials. And you can see in a part oh, I'm sorry, I probably texted and forgot to hit send. I apologize. Are you are you have you left? Are you here? Once okay. and once again. Yeah. Oh. And then when we use Ruby Dopa, the number of synchronization events uh this means that, that means that they go down, that meaning that we are disengaging this uh, synchronization of pathological activity patterns with this release of dopamine with light. Uh, we're very excited about this, this experiment because now we can also try to see what is happening in the imaging in vivo when we release dopamine just in brief moments. The problem with normal uh, treatments for uh, Parkinson is that you give L-dopa to the patients and that increased the levels of dopamine, but chronically. And after some years, you induce dyskinesias. They are called L-dopa induced dyskinesias because the dopamine was high like all the time. So with this approach, we can just raise dopamine, like increase the levels of dopamine when you, we turn the light. So we, we will not have this chronic increase of dopamine. And we think that, uh, we will not create the uh, ill dopa induced dyskinesias. You know? So I think that's that's something that that, that we are uh, trying to explore if that will work in, in, in that way. No? And, and it's local and you can just release with light and it's on the same wavelength of the imaging. So you can also kind of uh, put everything together you know? with different powers. You can release the dopamine with some other power. You can do the imaging and, and, and not uh, overlap these, these, these two things. Um, so um, 
that's pretty much all. Uh, this, these last experiments were done by, by my student, that's Angel on the, on the right. This, this is pre-pandemic teacher. Uh, <laughs> some, of, some of them are, they left. I have more people joining after that. So, and this is all the people that pays the bills and that's my Twitter. I, I don't read mail very often, but well, sometimes I, uh, so, <laughs> so if you want to follow me, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, Thank you for your there were many, many questions. I don't know if there's any questions at this time. And yeah, please, I see them. Yeah, it's a great talk. It was really, really fun. Um, so when you were showing the kind of like the Markov kind of transition probabilities of the di different states, um, it also looked like there might be more states available in the non Asian animals. Is it, is, you know, if that was something you observed, like more distinct, like more a larger yeah. vocabulary of available distinct states. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, after the the dopamine agonies, you can see also the more, more states. That also happened with when you inject, uh, when you put in the in the stratum, uh, muscarinic or cholinergic agonies, and and that's I think that related with the fact that. It's the culinary right? system is related to improve like the formation of new sequential activity patterns. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The reason I ask you, we have we were looking at aging and how it reduces the available kind of vocabulary. Aging. Aging. Yeah. With the vocabulary. Uh, no, with the vocabulary. Yeah. no, but I'm, that's I'm saying there might be some homology here in that it's somewhat like the neural Darwinist approach. If you don't have an available enough state to, you know, yeah. to represent things, you just because of the dopamine loss, I just can't represent positions and movements as richly. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, also now I, I'm also trying in the hippocampus mm. with a model of uh, Alzheimer's. You know? we, we inject some oligomers of beta amyloid, and we see that actually you reduce the ensembles and you kind of create a similar situation of the Parkinsonian one. And that, that also correlates well with the fact that you cannot learn more stuff, you know, because you are kind of engaged in the same same thing. Okay. Yeah. I think that 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 calls for for several pathologies. Uh, there's I, I didn't do those experiments, but another postdoc in Rafa's lab, he was working with some schizophrenic animals, like ketamine animals. He injected ketamine, and he saw that in normal animals uh, when you inject ketamine you lose this ensemble representation of the different orientations so now every time that you show vertical horizontal it's the same group of neurons firing together like the, this is schizophrenic mice understand the world totally different than normal ones so, so, so yeah, i think uh, more and more experiments now are, are are trying to figure out what happened with different kind of pathologies and but with the age that will be also something interesting to see like how, how this changes when the animals get older and older yeah, yeah, yeah. i was just going to ask you about the with these kind of tool uh, I, i've always thought that there was a, obviously a limit uh, depending on how ventral you want to go into the brain so in your experience what will be a limit uh, in terms of what structures, like for example, you mentioned hippocampus. I imagine you were looking at very dorsal parts of the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what, are, what are your thoughts on this, on this technology? The, some, uh, some approaches uh, that are used for the imaging part, they, they, they put like a green lens. Ah. These, are, these, these are lenses that are like flat. Uh -huh. So you can attach those to the microscope uh -huh. and then you can go very deep. I see. Uh, the problem with those is that you need to remove like everything that is above. No? I see. But they put the lens. To put the put the lens. lens. But the, yeah. but people is doing that, especially with the mini scope, like the yeah, yeah. The, the mini like uh, microscope that allows the animal to move freely. But also now there's I didn't have time to talk about that. But there's also three photon and four photon and five p microscopy, and with those one. With those ones, you can really go deep. You know, some people, I, I think a couple of uh, months ago, a paper came out recording in CA3 with uh, three or four uh, P, like multi-photon. Uh, 
So you can you, you can now go very very deep. The, the problem with that is that the lasers are still like non uh, available for everyone. So they are expensive ones, but but now you can also do like this three, four, five, and go even like one millimeter, two millimeters. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, uh, yeah, please. Oh, no, you said you possibly wanted to like revisit this, like you said, possibly put like these mice into virtual reality. What were you hoping to like see, like in a virtual space, like with these mice? So the the other experiments that I'm doing now is uh, that also helps you get But um, so for many years, you know, people say that the primary visual cortex didn't project directly to the creatin. Yeah. But a couple of years ago, the group of Carandini and uh, showed that there's a direct connection between primary visual cortex and the stratum. So the stratum again is related to movement and stuff, and primary visual cortex through the codification of images. And if you think about that, when you are moving in an environment, you need to know what's happening. If not, you you, you crash or or some prey comes and kills you know or things like that. So. So you need to kind of understand what's happening and integrate that with the movement. So that 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 those are the kind of experiments we, we want to do. We are recording in the stratum. We actually see that all these drifting, drifting orientations are also codified in the stratum. And uh, and we want to link now that with the movement of the animal because there must be a link in the stratum between how the animal moves and how it encodes the the images. So that that that's a uh, kind of experiments I, I I want to do. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, some people have done. I will talk about that tomorrow. Uh, this kind of experiments with in the hippocampus, for example. No. So they found they they made the animal run in a virtual reality wow. environment, and then train the animal to leak when they arrive to a specific location in the environment. And then they identify those neurons and now they can do the experiment. What happens if we activate the neurons of this place when the animal needs to live before? And the thing that happened is that if you activate this, those neurons before the animal arrives actually to the, the part, they start leaking. Like you kind of, they think they already arrived because you are activating those neurons related to that place. Yeah. But um, yeah, but I, I want to do more like the integration between the movement and and the integration of visual stimuli more than the place and, and uh, navigation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for. Wow, well, Luis, that was a great talk. <laughs> thank you for coming and the diehards that stay so. <laughs> Okay, so the John, do you know the instructions for what? Yeah, you know, so we we gotta do. We can go ahead and stop the recording. Stop the recording. So just do it. Yeah, and and yeah. So.